today I want to talk about using italics in creative writing. Italics can be a great tool to help clarify what you're trying to get across as an author, but they can also be overdone. And so it's important to know when to use italics and when to use another way to show your emphasis or your style or your point. This is Ignited Ink Writing, a channel dedicated to helping writers like you transform your writing so it lingers with readers, because writing that lingers gets remembered and recommended. I'm Caitlin Burphy, editor and writer. There are four times when italics are very useful in creative writing, and I want to cover those today. The first is thoughts. This is probably the most common use of italics I see, and it's a great one. If there's a moment when your character is directly thinking something and your readers get to see that thought, it can be really useful to put them in italics. Now you don't have to do this. You can also put a thought in quotation marks, or you can leave it as plain text and put he thought, I thought, she thought after it. Sometimes though, italics help with clarity. If you have a character who is thinking something while they're having a conversation with someone else, using quotation marks can be confusing because it looks like they're saying that thought out loud, even if you have the thought tag. Let's look at an example. Kevin watched the two old men stand up and punch each other across the chessboard. What is happening? Is one way of doing it. Or, what is happening? He thought. Or you can use both. What is happening? He thought. All three ways of showing the thought in the scene are correct. You could also have one where it's in quotation marks. It's up to you as the writer to decide what's best for your story. One thing I'll say is for any given piece, once you decide how you're going to show something is a thought, you need to stick with that technique. So don't put thoughts in italics and in plain text and in quotation marks all in the same story because your readers will become confused. I'd also like to note that it's particularly helpful to put thoughts in italics when you're in third person, omniscient, or second person points of view. That's because you have this anonymous narrator who is telling the story. Readers might not know that that thought is an actual thought. They might just think it's something that's being reported for the story. In first person, it's not quite as necessary because the character is telling the story. And by doing that, everything they're saying is really their thought. However, if you want to clarify that this is a thought that they were having in that moment in the story, you might want to use italics. One time when italics might not be such a good choice for thoughts is if you have characters who are communicating telepathically. And the reason for that is they're actually having a dialogue. They're not just having standard thoughts. You might want to consider finding another way of showing that dialogue than in italics so that you can save italics for thoughts that are only in the one character's head. I've seen it done using brackets, colons, semicolons, different spacing. So play around with it. Maybe italics are the right choice for your story. Maybe they're not. But definitely use italics for thoughts where appropriate. Italics are also used in creative writing to show a word or phrase is in a foreign language. If a word or phrase is not in an English dictionary, it has not been fully accepted into the English language. So just because it's common in your region of the English-speaking world doesn't mean that you can assume your readers know what that word or phrase means. I'm from New Mexico. We have a very large Hispanic population, so I have some Spanish words in my vocabulary that I forget other English speakers don't know. One is adios. Most people know that means goodbye, but I still can't assume that all of my readers know that. So what that means for your story is if that foreign word or phrase is really important for your reader to understand the character or the scene or the plot, then they need to be able to understand what that word or phrase means through the context. For example, ¿Dónde está el baño? asked Diego. Around the corner, said Sam, pointing to the restroom sign. Diego asked, where's the bathroom? in Spanish. Sam responded in English, and the action that he does after responding is also in English. So a reader who does not know what donde esta el baño means can figure it out by Sam's response. So that's an instance when that foreign phrase can really add to the character and to the setting 
but it's not inhibiting the reader from understanding what's happening. If that foreign word or phrase is not critical to the reader's understanding of the story, you don't have to necessarily explain it through context. If you have a character who's in an unfamiliar place where they don't know the language and they're looking at the street signs, you can put the street signs in that foreign language and not tell the reader what they mean because the character doesn't know what they mean either. And that confusion adds to the reader's experience and understanding of the character. Some reasons you might want to use foreign language words and phrases in your writing are to add the flavor of a foreign country, to show that your character is multilingual, or to show their heritage. And sometimes you also need to use that foreign phrase or word because it doesn't really translate into English. It can be a very powerful tool for kind of establishing your setting and your world, whether it's the real world or not. When you're using foreign words and phrases, there are two things to remember. The first is if you find yourself using a lot of foreign words and phrases in your story, it might be off-putting to some readers. I've read pieces where all of the dialogue is in Spanish. I don't speak Spanish, so I didn't understand what was happening in that story, and I stopped reading it and moved on to something else. Be aware that there's a difference between expecting your reader to be multilingual and using foreign words and phrases to add that really nice flavor. The second thing when you're using foreign words and phrases is it can be courteous and actually necessary to use the correct symbols from that language's alphabet. For example, Spanish and English are very similar, so a reader can kind of read a Spanish word or phrase. Spanish has the standard English N, and it also has an Ñ, which is the N with the little tilde swoosh over it, like in Baño. When you change the Ñ to an N, it can actually change the word that you're using. So you want to be aware of that when you're using foreign words and phrases. Put the accent marks where they go, figure out how to use a tilde on your keyboard when it's appropriate. Now there are some foreign alphabets that are just too different from English for that. If you're using an Arabic or Mandarin phrase, it's probably not going to work to put that in the proper characters in your story. Use your best judgment and be courteous to the other language whenever possible. Next, I want to talk about using italics for emphasis and style. When you put a word or phrase in italics, it stands out. And that's a great way to emphasize a point or a word, or to show which word a character is stressing in a dialogue. For example, a child could say, But mom, I don't want to. By putting the word want in italics, you're letting the reader know that that is the word the child character in your story is stressing. If you don't put that word in italics, a reader might think they're stressing mom and saying, but mom, I don't want to. It's different, and it could be a different character would stress different words. So that can be a good time to use italics for emphasis. If you find yourself using italics a lot to emphasize a specific point in your story, then you might not be putting in the work you need to to build up to that revelation or that point. I see this a lot in people who are used to giving speeches and not necessarily having their writing read. They will put in italics the sections they want to really emphasize with their tone and their body language. And that's a great note for you as a speaker. But that's not an acceptable way to use italics in creative writing. In creative writing, it's actually considered lazy to not arrange the sentence and the point in a way so that it stands out without the italics. I've also seen italics used for style, particularly in experimental writing. If writers are playing with form, the way words look on a page, italics can be a good tool for them to use. Just be aware that you do have other tools available to you if you're playing with form. You can change the font, you can change the font size, you can play with spacing, all sorts of things. Italics are a great tool for emphasis and style, just remember they're not your only tool. <laughs> the fourth time I see italics used frequently in creative writing is when a writer wants to reference another work of art. If you have a title of a large work, then that title needs to be in italics. For example, if you're referencing a specific novel, podcast, TV series, album, a blog, something like that should be in italics. 
Now, if you're referencing a smaller piece or a subset of one of those larger pieces, then it needs to be in quotation marks. That would be a short story or poem, an article, a specific episode from a TV show or a podcast, an individual song, that sort of a thing would be in quotation marks. For example, this is Ignited Ink Ready. That goes in italics. This episode is using italics in creative writing, thoughts, readability, and more. That goes in quotation marks because it's a subset of the larger work. And this is standard practice across the board as far as writing goes. I do want to leave you with a few cautions from an editor about italics before concluding this video. The first is italics can be difficult to read. So you want to avoid having whole passages, chapters, pages of italics. It's actually exhausting to the eye. Because of that, your reader is working harder to decipher your story, meaning they're reading slower and it gives the illusion that your story has a slow pace. It also can be too difficult for certain readers and they might just move on to something else. So don't make your readers work harder than they have to. I recommend taking a couple pages of your work in progress and turning it into italics and reading through the whole thing, then turning it back and reading it again and seeing which way was easier for you to read. I think that'll help you better understand how italics can be exhausting. As an editor, if I get something that has a large passage in italics, I'll actually turn it to regular text to edit it because it's easier for me to catch spelling, grammar, punctuation, mistakes. Along those same lines, italics are like other style choices and unique punctuation marks in that if you use them too often, they actually lose their effectiveness. If you have one word or phrase on a page that's in italics, that word and phrase really jumps out and your reader is going to notice it. If you are putting something in italics in every other sentence, now you have italics all over the page and nothing stands out. One thing that used to be acceptable in fiction and I would caution you to avoid is using italics to show something as backstory or a flashback. Please don't do that. <laughs> when you do that, you are putting a whole passage of text in italics and making that whole flashback and backstory piece difficult to read. It's also an excuse to avoid using a transition. As people, we rarely are suddenly overcome by a memory. Usually that memory is triggered by something we're currently experiencing. So your character's flashback should be triggered by something they're currently experiencing. Say I have a character and I want her to remember a time on her grandmother's farm. I might say, as she walked outside and smelled the wet earth, she was brought back to her grandmother's farm in Kentucky that summer. Smell is actually one of the strongest triggers of memory in humans, so it's a great tool to use to start a flashback or backstory. When you use backstory and flashbacks, you also need to transition back to the present. So it's clear you might have her think, but the smell of this earth was slightly different. Now we know we're no longer back smelling the dirt on our grandmother's farm. We're in the present smelling the dirt that's here and now. Now that I've cautioned you against overusing italics, I do want to say use italics where appropriate. Don't avoid them. They can be an incredibly powerful tool when it comes to clarifying your intentions as an author. Use them for thoughts, foreign words, titles, and emphasis in style to impact your readers. If you found this video helpful, please like below. And if you have any other instances when you find italics particularly useful in creative writing, let me know in the comments. I'd love to talk about it. For more videos like this, subscribe to Ignited Ink Writing, a channel dedicated to helping you transform your writing so it lingers with readers. I'm Caitlin Burvey, editor and writer. To find out more about me, go to www.ignitedinkwriting.com. Now it's your turn. See how you can use italics to help you ignite your ink.